a YouTube suggested video of how to give. Uh, you didn't see this on your okay. Uh, how to give a tech talk? And, uh, it said, uh, "Don't talk about yourself." You know, people have the the blurb. They know who you are. They've come to listen to you. They, no one say that your name is Mark Conrad because people know your name. And no one say you're from the developer with Anertech or. And I'd like Ireland's web agency of the year. We win lots of awards lots of times. There's no point in mentioning these things because you probably know them already. Uh, there's no point in saying that you're an admin on the Drupal Twig Slack channel, and if you're interested in front-end Drupal development, you should get onto that because there's a lot of help there for a lot of people. Um, there's no point in mentioning that you're interested in Drupal for good because, well, everyone's interested in Drupal for good. I'm a member of the Utopia team. I'm a member of the Beyond the Cyclist team. I maintain some very, very young popular modules and one theme that is so bad I've never even installed it myself on my own websites. Uh, it's a port of the WordPress 2017 team. I was going to uh, port one website, one WordPress team per week. I failed. Uh, I'm Mark Conner on Twitter, so if you want to, uh, I don't I have a very good Twitter experience, feel free to follow me. Um, okay, that was supposed to be a joke. I'm supposed to start with an interesting story. Uh, that's how you that's how you give a good talk apparently start with an interesting story. But I'm a developer and developers don't have interesting stories. We're all boring people. So this is a, as, as as good as I could come up with. And it's got nothing to do with Drupal, but it has the word open source in it, so I thought that will do. Uh, I tend to speak fast and sometimes I get excited and that's speaking faster. So if I speak too fast, maybe put your hand up and I probably think you're asking a question then. I don't know, you tell me to slow down somehow. Um, okay, this is me. <laughs> and we've just won a contract here, so we're fairly happy because it's going to be a six-week contract, so we know we've got at least six weeks left in the company before we're bankrupt. Uh, and I think, wow, yeah, here we go, another, another good website. Let's, uh, let's start being a code monkey. So let's start working. And I'm banging away on the keyboard, building, well, that's our own website there, we've got already built. And uh, this is going well, I think, I'm not sure why I started doing my code before we get the designs and whatnot. Then we realize, ah, this is one of those tenders where we win the contract to build the website. Somebody else wins the contract to design the website. Great, so we'd have to work with whatever designs we get from them, but you know, it's, it's okay, they're, they're professionals and whatnot. They tell us they're using Photoshop. <laughs> I said, they tell us they're using Photoshop. <laughs> well, I'm not very happy with this. You know, uh, they're, they're using a photo editor to design a website. But I have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea. I, I, I think there's a better way to design websites. I certainly think there's a better way to deliver the designs to our clients. So whatever we're using Photoshop to design it, certainly to deliver the designs. We, we, we have a plan. So a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but actually, I'm going to start off with a quite familiar story. So I'm going to do that part right maybe. Then why not use Photoshop? And by Photoshop, I don't mean just Photoshop. I mean, that's one of them. I, I mean Photoshop, I mean Sketch, I mean sending PDFs, uh, any of those static mock-up uh, applications. Uh, then very, very quickly, rapid prototyping, pen and paper, balsamic, Sketch app, that kind of stuff. And then we get into a brief overview of atomic design and Pattern Lab, and then specifically how we can integrate Pattern Lab with Drupal, and how that can make people, if not happy, happier. Or at least we don't have surprises for uh, for our clients that the website that gets delivered at the end is actually the exact same as the designs that they saw. It's not an approximation of it, not kind of like the designs, not almost like the designs. It will be the exact same, uh, pixel for pixel for the designs. So does this sound familiar? Someone designs a website. Either we do it in house, or somebody else in the contract with the design designs the website, and the client eventually signs off on after going through a number of iterations. And then you go and build a website based on these designs. You think you build a website based on these designs, and it looks quite like the designs. It's not exactly like it's not what they call pixel perfect. You know these designers that go not these designers, uh, these designers that go on with their pixel perfect lark. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost pixel perfect. There's a few things out here, a few things out there, simply because screen sizes maybe change. Um, and it's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault that CEO is on i8. It's not your fault that uh, the designer designed on a 22 inch monitor, and it's not your fault that the client looked at it on an iPad. Those screens are just different sizes, widths. 
Um, but that's not the client's thought either. The client isn't a professional. You're, you're a professional. They hired you to build it. They hired designers to design it. If they could do it themselves, they probably would. So it's not your fault. It's not the client's fault. But damn it, it's so... Someone edited my uh, slide. It's someone's fault. So let's see if we can, um, if we can fix this. Here's, here's the problem. The problem is in the real world, websites use real content. So not every headline is lower Ipsum dollar six ant. Building a website recently for a, a, a client of ours rather than a way too much detail. Uh, every title had five words in it. I said to designers, what are you going to happen? What are you going to do when uh, there's more than five words in the title? And the designer said, we are going to train them to write short titles. I said, that the longest word in a title has five letters. The designer said, yes, we're going to train them to have short, snappy titles. I said, the client has five words in their name. On the data website goes live, they're going to use those five words to say, that is the client's name. Those five words plus launches a new website. Day one, we have broken the website because they cannot write five word title for that when their name alone has five words in it. So we're going to use real content. You know, some of this content is going to want two lines. Some of this content won't have an image in the teaser because it's just a brief notice to say that there's a meeting or something like that. Um, not everything will fit into this lovely grid. So designs then with Photoshop and with Sketch and things like that, they're, they're, they're just static images. They're, they're an approximation. They're, 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 they're what? We are aiming towards when we build a website, but they're just an image. It's just a photograph of it. You know, you need to get the actual thing itself in your hands to, 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 to live it and experience it and know this is the website that will be built. So you don't come to Athens, you know, to see a photo of the Acropolis. Now that's what happens. <laughs> I came to Athens, and the only thing I want to see is the Acropolis. And I've had to work, I can't remember Wednesday day early, two days early, I had to work all day Wednesday and Wednesday night, and we had to work all day Thursday to launch at the site. And uh, we're going to the Acropolis tonight, I thought, but we're going to the Acropolis Museum. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, so these kind of designs, they're, they're, they're built in what I'd say is my hate, most hated design tool, that's Photoshop. So, this is a, a, actually created in Photoshop, because Photoshop is good at this, it's good at creating images. Uh, these are actual layers from a Photoshop design that we received. One of them you can see is called dot dot one. Now that's quite difficult to do because you know that's from a Word document that they got. It. That has lowercase characters. Someone had to actually delete the extension mm -hmm. and re-put it in with uppercase characters to align them. They've got a heading called subheading two. I have no idea what subheading two is in this context. I have no idea what rectangle nine is, except that it looks very close to rectangle eight. Uh, layer three uh, looks quite close to layer twenty-nine, and object title lorem ipsum dollar lorem looks like document one, which is not dot dot one. So this kind of confusion is tricky with Photoshop, that, that it's, it's, a, it's easy to create all these layers and create all these groups, but it's harder to put names on them. It's harder to actually make them make sense to a developer who has to come and build the damn thing uh, three months after you've designed it and you've forgotten why something is called something or why it gets all the way it is. Here's a design we got last week, uh, a slice from, from, a, from Photoshop. So we have a group, and inside the group we have a group, and we've got a rectangle, and we've got a design, devising an integrated implement of a broken layer. And then we've got a rectangle and a group, and a, about, and a group, and a group, and a pass, and a group. Uh, something that will identify the client, so I blacked it out. Uh, client to client, and, sorry, a group, a group, and a group. I haven't got a clue what's any of these things. And it takes a while to go down through them, and try and figure things out. So this is not helping the front-end developer. It's, it's just, it's not a good tool for websites. So it's a great tool for editing photos. The name is, or the, the, um, the point is in the name. Photoshop is for editing photographs. You get a photograph of the Acropolis and you make the sun darken a bit and you make the clouds disappear and you make it look really, really well. You win WordPress photo awards and things like that. Um, it's not for designing websites. Uh, one example recently, again, a client said was, this website looks different in uh, Chrome than it looks in uh, designs. I said, yeah, we're using desktop font and we're using our web font. It's the same font, but Photoshop renders them one way and Chrome renders them another way. Well, this is revelatory to the client and they weren't happy. They wanted to look like the designs. I wanted to look like the designs, but it's nothing I can do. 
Then they look at the Firefox. Of course, Firefox are in response slightly differently as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it, there's only so much we can do. And the more we can work in the browser, the more we can, we can deliver for the client what the client's expecting. Um, if you want to make a minor change in Photoshop, it's not very sustainable. I'm going to explain that in a moment. Um, and in Photoshop, I'll give three more reasons why I don't like Photoshop. And again, it's not just Photoshop. I don't think hidden on Photoshop, but I do want to get on Photoshop too much. Um, but it's also Sketch and, and other apps. So number one is not responsive. You will probably receive more designs for a desktop than you will for mobile. And I'm going to show of hands how many people get more designs for desktop than mobile. And more than 50% of your users are going to be on mobile. So you should be getting more than 50% of your designs for mobile first. So we're all mobile first, but it's actually mobile first after desktop. <laughs> um, so again, recently with a client of ours, client five names, we got 46 Photoshop files, over 300 megabytes of Photoshop in my Dropbox. Um, 40 of them were for uh, desktop, six were for mobile. Zero were for tablet. Tablet is an app to be somewhere between uh, desktop and mobile, again, whatever that means. And then you come up with, okay, your homepage has this little three panels, of course, every homepage has three little panels somewhere on it. What happens out on the mobile? Do you get two on top and one stretching? We squash them in. You know, we, we, we can't see these with Photoshop. We can't see these with, with static designs. Um, designers then will, will, will design with one um, specific browser. So, sorry, the designs will be from one specific browser site. So if they give you designs and they're 960 pixels wide, First question is, can you tell me what happens when this is 1,700 pixels wide? If they give you designs that are 1,700 pixels wide, is that a full 100% width background, or is it, does the image uh, in the hero have a ratio? And of course it has a ratio, so it's got you know, 16 to 9 ratio. That's fine. I turn on my 22-inch monitor, and it's massive, it takes up the whole screen. Oh, it's too big, it needs to be maximum 700 pixels. Okay, but you need to keep the ratio still. Yes. How do we keep a ratio when you've got a max height? And how can Photoshop explain this to us? We can't. So designers design in you know, bigger and bigger screens, 27-inch iMac monitors. Users use on smaller and smaller screens on our <coughs> iPhone 5s and that, and never the twin shall meet. So designers want this big experience. Users just want functionality. And again, using Photoshop, we don't give them that experience. All we give them is a visual approximation of what it might be like. Um, designs then get zoomed out. So you, you send a PDF or you send a Photoshop file or whatever it is to the, to the client. The first thing they do is they'll start hitting uh, command minus to make it smaller, smaller, smaller so they can see the whole thing on one page or they'll, God forbid, <laughs> they'll print it off in an HP sheet. Um, who looks at a website like that? The pixel, pixel size is down to about one pixel, maybe two pixels. Uh, it can't be read. So what you need to do is let people see these things in the real environment, send them a URL of this is what your website is going to look like. And if they happen to look at it on a phone, they'll see what it's going to look like on a phone. If they happen to look at it, at it on a, um, a tablet, they'll see what it looks like on a tablet. And if they happen to look at it on a desktop, you can guess what's going to happen. Uh, realistically, they should only be able to see the above the fold items first. They shouldn't get this zoomed out look and see the, like, you know, the whole website, the header, the footer, because nobody would experience the website like that. The third reason is too easy for bonkers ideas. Um, Here's three examples of things I have been asked for by clients. Uh, and I, I, I preface that with not by clients of our present, of, of Anatech that are present who work, work with, just when I was uh, freelancing and when I was working privately as a seven by person for smaller clients. Number one is when you click this link here, so they've got a link on their website, <laughs> it opens a Wikipedia article about that, but Wikipedia has to be themed like our website because we want to use our theme colors. No problem talking about a fire Photoshop. I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like. You can send it to the developers and tell them to do it. <laughs> That's easy for a designer to do. And Photoshop is a great tool for doing that. But done deal is the Irish version of eBay. Client came to me, uh, sells stoves and fireplaces and things like that. And uh, I don't like our website on done deal. And I said, you don't have a website on done deal. Good. We do, we have an e-commerce website. So I built your website, I know there's no e-commerce on it. Yeah, we have an e-commerce website on done deal. Uh, are you placing ads on done deal? Are you selling things on eBay, basically? Yes, right. Done deal is all brown though, Mark. Our color scheme is orange and blue. Can you change that for us? Nope, I don't 
don't know what it's legal, I don't know what eBay, I can't change it. But we're not happy with it. You have to do something. You know, we're paying you to. I don't own the There's nothing I can do. A designer can do that in Photoshop. No problem. Give it to me. You can insist that I do. I still can't do it. So when we were finished doing that and having that conversation, he then said to me, okay, right, Grand. We don't like the look of our website on Facebook. <laughs> <sighs> when you click this button, leave lens flare. You know, again, that's simple in Photoshop. But it's, it's damn hard to, uh, to code. So I think maybe I'm just doing something wrong. And I need to contact Sheik. Sheik uh, sent me an email just this morning. He has post uh, stress disorder. He wants to convert that to HTML. He's an expert at it, so maybe Sheik has the answer. He says he's going to uh, convert PSD to HTML static and make it responsive. Well, that'll be the first time I've encountered Photoshop's uh, files getting responsive. So yeah, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or Sheik she is doing something right, but uh, I might be replying to him. So what's better? Well, SketchUp is better, it's faster. Its file size is smaller. Um, it's got a more intuitive interface. It, it just does the things that designers really want rather than uh, lots and lots of different things. Um, it's a beautiful tool to work on. I, I, I absolutely find it fantastic. It's great for building UIs. But at the end of the day, ultimately, it fails for the same reasons Photoshop does. It still outputs a static image of what the website might look like when you're finished developing. The next screen here is a, an image of a quick mock up I did of uh, our internal task timer, and I have no idea why I put it there. So I have nothing to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, does anyone know who Clark Wahlberg is? One person. Can you stay quiet? And you and you, please, don't ruin my joke. <laughs> Clark doesn't like InVision. He thinks it's a very bad experience to use. Does anyone agree with Clark? And it's a bad experience. Okay. Clark, I'm of course, I don't like to look at that. Like that. Uh, Clark Volberg is the CEO of Envision, and I tweeted there a while back. More often than not, it's a shit experience Envision that was loading for me. And Clark said, uh, unfortunately, you are correct, sir. I'm all over it. They expect significant improvements soon. And fairly, then they followed up with a few more emails and instances. He went with an interview or a chat about how uh, my experience of Envision could be better. And short of winding up the company, I don't <laughs> see a point in talking to them. So the solution for me is design in the browser. This talk was called uh, Back to the Future. In the past, in the present even still, we had HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the old school tools of the web. And I'm saying, let's go back to them. Let's just use them. They're perfectly fine, because at some stage in the web build process, you are going to have to write the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript. So why not do it at the design phase rather than at the uh, implementation phase? Let's not send PSDs and PDFs to our clients, and instead let's send a URL. So if you want to use Photoshop as your internal tool, if you want to use Sketch as your internal tool, that's not a problem. I have no problem with our designers sitting down beside me with Sketch and saying, right, this is the UI we're going to build, Mark, here's what Heather's going to be like, what do you think? Oh, great, yeah, fantastic. I'll implement that. I'll implement that in Pattern Lab, or I'll implement that in a static HTML mockup. But what I will send to the client will be a URL. And they can click on the URL, the same they click on the URL to open the vision experience. Um, except they'll see the actual website. So you open up a, an Envision um, link on a mobile phone, and it's the desktop uh, design you're looking at. You're going to see the desktop version on your phone. You open up the um, mobile uh, views on Envision on your desktop, you're going to see the mobile views. That's not that's not good enough. So you send a URL. If they open on their phone, they'll see a responsive website. You see a small screen version of the website on a tablet, medium size, and on desktop, the large version. And you have to do this at some stage. So it actually saves you time to just get it done in the earlier stages. So here's the solution, really. You do some discovery, find out what your client wants. Usually that's bull, because they don't know really what they want, except they want a new website. They've got their internal processes and their marketing department run everything on the front page and things like that. So then you do the actual research where you talk to your client's users. That's what the client actually wants, what the users need the website to do. Then do some rapid prototyping. There's your pen and paper. Draw a few little quick sketches. Yep, that looks good. Let's try something like that. Um, use some post-it notes. 
go to stage two of rapid prototyping, maybe use balsamic or sketch or something, just to give very quick wireframes, definitions, and things like that. Of, um, the kind of approach we're thinking of for this website, is there going to be uh, a header with a logo on the left-hand side and a search bo uh, box on the right-hand side, of course, it's on every website. Is there going to be a slider? Yeah, there is going to be a slider. It's going to have loads of images in it. It's going to have websites. So, but you can at least get those things out of the way so you know things you have to build. And you agree in the design components. And perhaps take an atomic design approach. You don't have to take an atomic design approach, but, but, but perhaps do. And I'm going to guess everyone here at this stage has heard of Pattern Lab, and, and so I won't go through atoms and molecules, organisms, and basic pages. That's, um, I, I, I presume it's up. Has everyone heard of it, yeah? Uh, but with Drupal, we, we, we need to match these things up. So we, we want to write the front end, but we don't want to do it once. We don't want to write the front end in Pattern Lab, and then rewrite it all in Drupal. Are, are you know right most of the pattern lab and some of them do but let's keep everything in pattern lab and uh, let Drupal do its magic in, in the CMS there. So basically you create component component designs in pattern lab you create a card uh, component and you create a header component and you create a home page uh, layer component things like that. In Drupal then you create you put your templates folder and you for each component you've got in pattern lab you create a corresponding file in Drupal and one maps uh, one one to the other. And then the client will eventually sign off on these designs that they see, and when they sign off on the designs, they will have signed off on your Drupal team. There's a bit of Drupal team work maybe it's still be done, but in general, that's the team done and finished. So usually where you get uh, the designs and the back enders build the website, then the front enders come in and do their um, do the front end work, and then the QA starts and things like that. that. That gets scrapped, and we start QA reading at stage one, and where the client signs off in stage two or three, uh, well, that's finished. You, you, your your front enders can, uh, can retire early. So this is a very simple example. Now it's ugly and it's deliberately ugly just so we can, we can actually see everything, everything's mapped. So on the top, we've got pattern lab with some dummy data, five menu items, home, about us, our work, blog, and contact. And on the bottom, <laughs> sorry, on the bottom there, we've got uh, the same uh, styles coming in, but it uses Drupal's real data um, with home articles, pattern lab, safe email, test article, and contact us. So we can see that whether we want to add an extra menu item, that's not going to break. Our designs are flexible enough to handle this kind of thing. Pattern Lab has set up uh, its systems, and Drupal set up its, and they can talk one to one. Going a bit further then, and just uh, main menu, if you add in, say, a branding block, so you've got the name Anartec and the slogan Web Design Perfected. And you can see top and bottom, they are both pixel for pixel identical. So everything is exactly as it should be. So when the client looks at the top one and says, yep, that's the header we want. Well, that's the header that they're going to get. Then we go a little bit further. There's a picture of us winning loads of awards. Um, and you can see that the title of the pattern lab on the left and the title of the article from Drupal on the right have the exact same font and the exact same place and the exact same size. They both have the same underline and things like that on the image. The text sizes are the same in both and the header is always in. So you're, you're mapping exactly one for one what, 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 what's in the designs with what Drupal is going to output. So here's some simple code. If you want to work out how to do this very easily, the, the, the cheater's guide to it is, uh, on the left-hand side, I've got a menu called horizontal-menu.twig, and that has the code from main-menu.html.twig, so just the code from Drupal's menu uh, file. So now I know that the, the code in the pattern app is going to be exact same as the code in Drupal. How do I know that? Because I stole it from Drupal. Um, actually, I asked a question earlier on about having uh, two blocks of things in, in different places and how you might uh, get name conventions. And I see a menu underscore underscore horizontal here. So I, I did the right thing, I think. So that's, that's the menu, as you can see here on the top. And in Drupal, all we do is say that the main, uh, sorry, menu height, height main, HTML, that twig, just includes the file that finds upper upstream in, uh, in Pattern Lab. The same then with the branding block, we write the code that Drupal's going to output in, in, into a Pattern Lab, and then we'll extend that in, uh, in Drupal, in the block system branding block file. Uh, the article one then, same thing, we get some nice clean HTML, has an article title, article image, article body, and article tags, and we'll map that then with uh, the, the node hyphen hyphen article hyphen hyphen full HTML twig. And what we do then is say that, that, that what we've called title in Pattern Lab, Drupal uses the um, variable label. What we've called body in Pattern Lab, Drupal uses the content.body field, and so on with the other fields. Now, there's one little issue that we'll have with this, which is that 
the pattern lab one is always going to find an image because in our JSON file we have said there is an image here, which means you're going to have an empty image div in Drupal and you don't want that. The other problem you're going to see will be that all the Drupal attributes that we have the data attributes and the quick edit links and things like that that, that make Drupal 8 so helpful for accessibility, they're all gone because we don't have the attributes array. So to fix that, here's a component called a card. So on the left, I've wrapped my stuff with if statements. So it's if there's a title, then we get an H2, and within the title, if there's an image, we put in the image. And on the opposite side of that, sorry, and, and on line 17, you can see we do have the attributes um, um, array in there. So we, we, we continue to have all that goodness from Drupal for ourselves. And then in Drupal, I've, this one is a little bit more compli complicated. What I've done is said that if we're using paragraphs module, so if paragraph uh, the field Parrot title has a value. So if there's something in that, then create a new variable called parrot title, and the same then with the uh, text and the image and the call to action fields. And then I swap those new variables. So then title becomes parrot title, text becomes parrot text, and so on. So that allows us to keep all the greatness of the Drupal 8 accessibility and data attributes and things like that. It allows us to use um, Pattern Lab, and it also allows us to have fields not filled in. So if a parrot doesn't have an image, we don't get any divs. So why is this such a good approach? Well, it's such a good approach because this is sustainable. So on the left, um, this is what normally happens with Photoshop and things like that. The client doesn't like the background color of the buttons, asks you to change it, and you go through their, your 200 layers on 46 files and change the background color of the button on every one of those. That takes a while. The designer charges by the hour, and the car is young. On the other side of that, the client doesn't like the uh, background color on the buttons. The developer changes the CSS for dot button. And that's one line of change, one line of code gets changed, and the developer needs to stay working for another while because you can't change, you can't charge too much for a thirty seconds work. So the sustainability of using design in a browser, of using Pattern Lab, or using any um, any uh, uh, generation tools, let's say, rather than using uh, Photoshop, is fantastic. Why is it good? It's good because we got some uh, QA done very early, early on. So rather than us building the website and asking the client, will you sign off each component as we're designing, as, as we're building it, and they always say yes. And when you ask them to do some testing, they're always busy. And then they tell you, we want to test the whole homepage in one go, please, not just individual parts. We want to test the whole about section. Um, so usually what end, ends up meaning is that the QA comes in near the end of the process. And at that stage, you've spent the budget and you haven't built what the client was expecting, but you have built what you thought was expected. Um, when, when we do this, it takes longer, it costs more money, and eventually we get the sign off and the site goes live. With a design in the browser kind of approach, same thing designer designs the website, but this time we use the browser to deliver the designs, but it may be designed in Sketch or Photoshop or whatever, but it will be delivered as a URL. The client will test the device the designs on a real device or so whatever device they happen to be using, that's what they'll see on. So they won't see a photograph of the website which will look perfect on IE8 or, or, or Windows 97, whatever they're, they're using, it will, and look the exact same on every device. So they'll see the real thing, and the finished design is the finished front end. And I think that's really important, and I think that, that's, that's really what we should be aiming towards, that, that we get this QA out of the way as quickly as possible, and that the backend developers can be working on, on, on whatever they need to do to output the classes that we've developed for them. Why is it so good? We've got a living style guide. You tell the client, uh, where's your style guide? You don't have one. Can we build you one? Yeah, you can. How much is it going to cost? Well, it's you know 10 days work. They're not going to pay for that. If you use something like Pattern Lab, well, you have no choice but to build a style guide. You, you basically build a style guide by accident. Um, so at the end of, at the end of, keep going. at the end of the design process, the client has a style guide that they can that they can follow. Now you, you, you might wonder, okay, I've got smaller clients and they, they don't have the budget for the whole pattern lab experience, let's say we've designed every single type of button for them and every heading style and all that. But if you want a cheaper way of doing that for yourself, don't style every button individually and inherit them into the molecules and into the, into the um, organisms and things like that. Just create one file called header and stick every single one into the header into that one file and style that. That's starting to get towards design in the browser for you. Another file then called card, put all the card stuff into it. Um, another one called login form, you have your login form and your input and your buttons, and that all went to the one place. 
And when you get back to refactoring parts, of it, then you know, when there's more widgets, you can start abstracting those a bit. But there should be nothing wrong with uh, creating those components as full standalone components rather than um, uh, built up patterns, let's say. If you're looking for a slightly easier way to, to get started on it. Um, what's this one here? The style guys not updated. Yeah, this is another one we had. We, we got designs three months later. My Dropbox notification said there's uh, new files in Dropbox and they were called designs updated. And there was a style guide created somewhere in the middle of the original designs and the designs updated. So what we built didn't look like the style guide. We had different fonts and different colors. What was in the style guide didn't look like the updated designs. But the client wanted something in the middle of all of those. So you know, if, you, if you do design the browser kind of stuff, you update things once. Again, you've got no choice but to be working with the most up-to-date style guide then because there's no other way you can work. And you've got your Git history. So you can go back and see how things work if, if you want to change things. Regression testing. We use static data when, when, when we use this kind of approach because if we were to output JSON from Drupal and use that in our in our pattern lab, that would be great, and you could see exactly what the most updated content looks like. But if you've got, say, a listing page of events, every event has a date. Uh, when you go back to do some regression testing, if you add a new component, the dates will have changed, so your regression test is going to fail. If you've got a slider on the, on the home page and that slider has a Christmas promotion on it, well, you do your regression testing a month later, and it could be a promotion for uh, summer holidays. Again, your regression test is going to fail because the images will look different. Now, they're easy fails. You can say, oh, that's just the image. That's just the data. But we prefer to use static content. Um, real content, but static. So it's, it's a 10 sample blog posts from the client's website. So it would be actual, the actual type of content the client would be using. Um, yeah, so 30 minutes, thank you. So a new design component gets added, looks great, and then three weeks later, something has broken, and the CEO has a heart attack. With regression testing, a new design component gets added. Each pre-existing component is automatically tested against um, the static, the, 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 the snapshots we have taken of it. Um, Pattern Lab is great for having a, a feature called, I think it's called Ancestry, where any component you have, if it's, say, if it's an organism, it will tell you the molecules that make up this component are this and this and this. So you know if you change that organism, you may break these molecules or atoms. And then it also tells you further up a chain that this organism is used by uh, the following templates or the following pages. So it's, it's got that great ancestry to let you know that, that this might break the following things. Um, so each, each component can get tested and make sure that nothing breaks. And then three weeks later, the CEO, and that's say, uh, is still in good health. And everyone is happy. Drupal Camp Dublin is on October 20th and 21st in October. Can you be the folks that you are all very welcome to Ireland if you have any questions? Um, so you mentioned that you use Photoshop and Sketch as an internal tool. Uh, yeah, we use a very similar approach for creating like uh, uh, components for clients. Uh, we don't use Pattern Lab, but we use KSS, but it's yeah. kind of a similar approach still. Uh, so one of the problems that we have is uh, the fact that uh, the way we work with the clients usually is that we try to deliver something as early as possible uh, so that we can catch the possible failures as early as possible so that they, so that it's cheap to fail. Yep. Uh, is there any other tools than Photoshop or Sketch that you would suggest for creating the designs? Because if they are not very good for the responsive, but we still would like still would like to be able to demonstrate at least on some level at that point the, the responsiveness of, of the <clears throat> not that design. I know of and not that I would want to use because you you're failing early using the sketch and they don't they won't like it, they don't whatever you can change it, but if they're you're gonna have a bigger failure if you give them things in sketch and then you build what you think you're expecting and it's different. So I I, I wouldn't like to use anything that's that all I want to do is hand over a URL and I, I, I can't imagine at the moment no I can't imagine how how we can bridge that gap. So um because it seems like it's uh, very late in the process that you are now uh, discussing with the client about what is the end result or what is the design going to be like? Do you build something like uh, no, 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 wireframes no. or? Yeah, that, that's what I was saying about the, the, the rapid prototyping. We, 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 we do our pens, we do our papers, our post-it notes, uh, 
you know, uh, flip charts and those kind of things. That's fine. Uh, we use Balsamic or maybe Sketch for, for quick wireframes and that. Uh, but the actual components, it, it, it doesn't take long to write some HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So if, if someone creates a header or a slider, you, know, you, can, you can probably grab code from somewhere else and, and slot, slot it in. Yeah, uh, so what I've seen is that maybe in a sketch you can make like something quick in, in a day, but I think it's three times more, at least, if you, if you do in HTML. Like, I don't know, maybe it's just that we are not as good in HTML and CSS. But... Perhaps, I'm, I'm going to take the data at a time. Yeah. I, I, I think we're, we're, we're making bigger problems for ourselves when we, when we don't do that. I, I think we, you might get better results for some parts, but you, I think you're going to get bigger failures. So we, we found bigger failures at the end when, when we were handing over what we think is a great website and the client says, that's not doing the thing we wanted to do. We could we be also reverse engineering. I don't know. Uh, it seems like also that the problem that we are having is slightly different because of, I haven't really had the, uh, the same problem with having the uh, delivering sketch designs or Photoshop designs that uh, we would have to um, like. I, I'd say, Laurie, we probably are having maybe a slightly different discussion with each other at the moment because for us, a lot of our work is, is building the websites rather than the design. So a lot of say, government contracts that we work with, there's two genders. One is to be design, one is to be builders. So for us, a lot of it would actually be that they've gone through this process and they've gotten the sketch version of it, and then we have to build it. You know, So we, we actually don't do very much design ourselves. Oh, yeah. So when we do, this is how we want to deliver it. But we're, we're, we're getting more design work, but we're, we're kind of early in the design uh, industry. Let's say. Well, I think that... That makes sense then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello. I would like to clarify something. Uh, yeah. uh, you have mentioned uh, the, the designer in both, in uh, one case, um, have, having to change the, the design, and in the other case, to have to change the component. Uh, these two designers are not the same. The one is a designer who designs uh, in Photoshop or Sketch or something. Yes. And the other is a themer. Yes. Actually, uh, how does this work in uh, real case scenarios? It's no different than how, we pre how people presently work because at the moment you get a designer who uses Photoshop and you get a themer who does the front end. Same thing, we can get a designer who, who will design component base wise. Uh, Still need to use a Photoshop or a sketch and a front end or then to implement it. So it's it's just that that, that I'm trying to get people to deliver uh, what the finished product is going to look like soon. But you, you still need two people. Unless you got you get you have someone uh, who is a designer or developer that, that can do design and development at the same time. That, but it's very rare to get that. So yeah. we're, we're we're happy to, to say, yeah, we still need to pay a designer to design it using whatever they feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And then we still have to pay the front end developer to implement it, like we always had to. So we yeah it doesn't it doesn't it, doesn't, uh, it, it hasn't yet saved money for in that sense except that we, except much. that we get the QA done quicker and, and sign off faster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else questions? Hi Mark. Hi Ross. Um, question: This pattern labs that you pattern libraries that you use is it one library for an effect or do you create a library per site? How does it work? Can you rephrase the question? Yeah, so you use a pattern lab, right? With all these yeah. quick files and all these small components. Yes. I'm not used to this to this scenario, but do you create one, do you have like, like one set of patterns that you reuse for every website that you create? Like an annotate based one? No. Or do no, you create we, one like for Yeah, we, we use the phase two pattern lab implementation. Uh -huh. um, we, we would hope that there would be patterns built up that if someone said to us, what could we like the design of the slider on your Oxfam site? We'd like the design of the carousel on your Ireland.ie site. Mm -hmm. We could take each directly from those dropping into the new pattern now, let's say. But each, each instance would be the same so as every website you make, you have a new group of things. So each would be custom to the to the client of the project. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I take it it's not all for Drupal, yeah? Sorry? I take it it's not only for Drupal. I mean, no, it's it's an open source platform. And but I can use it for any other. Yes, it's, a, it's it's in effect it's a static site generator. Um, and the version we use, it, the version two of it allows you to use whatever template you manage you want. So you can use uh, PHP or you can use Twig or you can use Node or or whatever. 
because of that, then you can, once it's built in, um, I don't know, you could use WordPress or Joomla or anything else you want to access. So all you do is access and basically CSS and uh, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. So yeah, any, any framework can access it. Thank you. Do one more story. So I just have a kind of announcement. I have a uh, presentation tomorrow about the state of Drupal H frontend, where I will be covering a little bit of like the next steps of this, like how to support this in core, what are the open problems that we have for properly supporting something like this. So it's definitely, if you are interested in implementing something like this with Drupal, it can be interesting presentation to hear about the uh, difficulties or the struggles that we currently have with this approach. I'll be in the front row. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.